please bear with me. Right. So what I'd like for you to do as we go forward is to, um, when, you, when you're asking questions, you know, you click, your, click the button on the participant button at the bottom of your screen and then click on the raise hand button at the bottom right hand corner and wait for, to be acknowledged. Please mute your microphone and be mindful of the background noises in your environment. If you choose to use your camera when asking a question, be sure it is in a stable position and focused at eye level and ensure there is no distraction behind the camera. Um, what else can I say? Is there anything I'm leaving out? Is there anything you'd like me to, to, to ask me at this time? No? Yes? If not, I think we're ready to begin with our first presenter. Should we go ahead um, and teach Sorry? us today? Should we go ahead? So the first topic we will explore is COVID-19, the Jamaican experience. Status of the pandemic in Jamaica, some facts about the virus, vulnerabilities and immunity, the myths and myth busters, a call to action, and a short quiz. And this will be delivered by Dr. Camille Toms Rodriguez and Dr. Johannes Rodriguez. Dr. Camille is a specialist in microbiology and Johannes Rodriguez is an epidemiologist. They're both Christian people and they're both members of the Bethel family. And so over to you, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, so we'll just begin uh, uh, look at um, what has been in Jamaica so far when it concerns COVID. And we'll start by um, trying to get the computer to work. <laughs> okay, so we're all familiar with new things that have come to Jamaica in the past few years. We have had swine flu back in 2009 and 2013. We had chikungunya in 2014. And we had Zika in 2016. And each time a new disease comes to Jamaica, we have to adapt and um, um, accept it into our lives as it changes our approach to health and our approach to our daily lives. Now in 2020, we've had the coronavirus, um, COVID-19. Of course, it was initially NCOV and then later got it changed to COVID-19. And it has affected our way of life more than anything has in the past, well, in my lifetime, at least. Um, in so many ways, not just in ways of health, but in social life and um, communal life. And the real thing, the crux of the matter is um, prevention is better than cure in any event. Because where coronavirus may have a mortality rate, overall mortality rate of 3%, um, depending on where you are, um, which is kind of lower on par with other viruses um, that we've experienced before. Um, it does confer some amount of morbidity, mortality, and unexpected impact. Um, nobody knew before that uh, a virus could cause increase in coagulation or cause clotting, because traditionally viruses don't cause clotting. They do the opposite, they cause bleeding. So for to have a virus that we can't predict what will happen, prevention is always better than cure. Um, we propose different ways of protecting each other, um, protecting ourselves from persons, and of course, everybody is familiar with it, the social distancing, the hand hygiene, and the mask wearing. Um, and also that we should clean our services and high touch areas. And for the most part, persons follow instructions. Although Jamaicans, anywhere we go, you know, we love the 
the bungalow, <laughs> the bungalow uh, mentality. Um, perhaps it's going back further than that. It's a cultural thing where we don't mind each other company, no matter what. But other ways we have to protect our bodies is to change our approach to even the smallest things that we do. Um, we know that our hands are the most promiscuous parts of our body. We have learned that in school or in TV. And it's true, your hands go places that other parts of your body won't go. Um, and your hands um, touch things uh, that you may consider innocuous, innocent. And so hand hygiene is, is very important, um, especially when it comes to touching things that we may not have considered. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll always advocate for keeping hands clean um, and for being mindful of where you touch. Uh, the scientific research, however, is changing all the time. So whereas when you advocate for the social distancing, the face covering, the hand hygiene, um, different things may change as things, um, as information comes in. And there are lots of things that we don't know. We don't know if immunity comes after first or second or third infection. We have seen from the literature that persons may be able to um, contract the disease more than once. And we've seen from practice that person's antibody response almost goes back to zero a little after having the disease. They're unlike other diseases where your, your antibody response is up. And should you be exposed again, you can fight it. With COVID, we haven't observed that um, on a scale that we can advocate or advise that there's no infection after first infection. We don't know why some persons get very ill and some persons have no illnesses at all. And that information is changing all the time. Until two days ago, there was, I heard a proposal about why people lose their sense of smell. And they're saying that it may be because of inflammation around the smell nerves, the smell in the nerves that conduct smell. And that this inflammation may cause long lasting effects so that people may lose their sense of smell indefinitely, forever and they won't get to enjoy another Akan South fish again. Um, and so I think information is changing all the time. People early on in the outbreak about March, April, May, everybody was scared that it was airborne. People kept calling me and asking me if it is, it's true that it is airborne. And the slightest piece of wind of information I got, they would ask me. And to this day, we know that some things can cause it, the virus to be aerosolized, meaning that it can float in the air up to 160 feet from the point of production. So if somebody has the virus and they, um, they undergo a procedure, it can cause that virus right there to go into the air, but it doesn't mean that it's floating all around. And um, once you hear it airborne in Jamaica, everybody in Jamaica will get it. We haven't found that experience as yet. So as far as we know, it is not airborne. Some people even ask if ganja can help. I don't know. I don't know. I think there are some studies going on right now to see if marijuana has any medicinal effects on it. Even things that we thought we knew are changing all the time. And I'll go into other things that we thought we knew. Um, before, initially, we're saying, when early out in the outbreak, we're saying that if you don't have symptoms, you can't spread it. And I used to, I used to um, educate persons on this. Um, lead us to say, I've been very quiet since I found out that it can be asymptomatic, having no symptoms and still spreading disease. But lots of things are changing. So don't be surprised if somebody comes out with conviction today that something goes up. And by tomorrow, we have to change our, our communication. Let's give an update again. Our first case was detected in Jamaica on March 10th, 2020. And since then, we've had um, a number of what we call waves where there have been increases in the number of cases. Now, people are wondering, suppose some people did reports at one point and don't report on another point, or suppose the lab, you can't test and you don't get back positives and later. That way to make it look like that when we have let tests can do, we have more cases than when we can do. It's not really the case because what we do is we, we're testing persons all the time 
and will report based on their date of onset. Okay. Um, and so we're not looking on, we're not looking on a wave in a sense that um, we expect cases to come and go in, in high numbers. We're looking at a time when we're, and we've passed it now, the inflection point. The inflection point is where we have so many cases we could have said that we're in community spread. And of course, this came in the second half of September of this year. Um, all of the waves before were not really waves that are actually related to workplace clusters. So it wasn't in the general population where we saw increases, it's really clusters of cases. And we expect we expect it to spread in, in persons who are clustered together. So it's not really a representation of community spread. But it's a more um a, a better communication is the other things that we use for surveillance in Jamaica. And so all the time, no matter what, we always take a, a study of persons who have SARI, that is severe acute respiratory illness, ILI, that is influenza-like illness, and things like admitted low respiratory tract infections. These things are what we call syndromes. It could have been COVID, it could have been flu, it could be the common cold, it could have been um, something else. Once it causes you to have fever and cough, we'll count you and test you. And this has been going on in Jamaica for decades. This has allowed us to, to recognize when there's an outbreak of flu, even before we start testing for flu. And this will allow us to see when there are problems with COVID, even when we can't test for COVID. So we use these syndromes as proxies um, of disease severity and spread. And so when we look back at the data, I've had the data from March, and we look at the curve, the darker line above represents the um the epidemic that or I should say the lines represent the epidemic thresholds, the levels above which we can call something an outbreak. The bars at the bottom represent the number of cases we have for this year. Use with specific statistics to calculate the lines so that in any given year, should you have the number of cases exceeding the lines, we can say that we're an outbreak. And you can see for the earlier part of the year, none of the bars, the vertical bars, cross um, their thresholds, you have age thresholds. And so the darker bar barely skims along the epidemic threshold for the over 60 early on in, in week seven and seven and eight and some part of six. But the other thresholds for the five to 59 year old age group and the under five, they were way below the epidemic threshold. And then uh, you can see the, the over 60, they came back down to normal levels um, for that period of time. So at the time, we couldn't say there was any outbreak or any impact of any respiratory illness, whether it be COVID, flu, common cold, or otherwise, um, based on our robust um, non-disease specific surveillance. I should let you know, however, a lot of people say, but if, if COVID break out in a hospital or in a health center, everybody go and catch it. And we're mindful of that. So we have something specific called healthcare workers surveillance as well, where we'll test healthcare workers and we're, we have specific actions associated with it. Should we find any um, healthcare worker that is sick um, or for whatever reason we test and find them positive, we can um, get the data behind it and do the specific interventions around it. We even have fever and rash surveillance because um, COVID may come with a rash as well. Plus, we have rash that is specific to dengue, chikungunya, measles, and rubella. And we we'll mention fever and rash because COVID can come with various presentations. So we monitor everything for um, all our syndromes, the seven syndromes that we have, to see if there's any increase anywhere. And we have to need to take a closer look to detect anything possible. Fever and rash is, 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 comes in um, important as well in one of the things that actually follows COVID. And this is multi-system multi -system inflammatory, inflammatory syndrome. You've probably heard of something called Kawasaki disease. And now this is not a disease that you get if you ride a bike but it's a disease that was discovered in Kawasaki, Japan. 
and um, it looks at a series of, of, of symptoms, fever, rash, swelling of the lips, uh, what we call desquamation or stripping of the lips. And this is something that people can get even after having COVID. So we're checking for this as well, especially in children, to see if we missed any cases. So we're always following up. Um, and so we have the data for Jamaica now to say that most of our cases have cough. And then some of our cases, not, the second most common symptom would be fever. And actually the first, third most common presentation for COVID is fever plus cough. And then the other things come after that, headache, sore throat, shortness of breath, runny nose, loss of smell, loss of taste. And some persons may get, as I mentioned, multi-system inflammatory syndrome after having COVID. I don't want to take too long, but other things to think about. Lots of people were early on in the outbreak were saying that heat and humidity can actually protect a country from COVID. And this has some credence because guess what? The virus and the microbiologist will tell you, the virus doesn't like hot, dry places. It dies quickly in hot, dry places. And that's why um, the virus can actually survive in your freezer for longer periods of time. But we found that the virus can survive on, on surfaces in good conditions up to four days um, and variable conditions up to 48 hours. It loves inside the body. So once it leaves the body, if it doesn't have a supportive environment, it will uh, dry out and die. But um, there are lots of things that come into play because people, people in hot climates um, will love to bungle up in AC. So you'll have more persons concentrated. Well, is in North America, it's summer now, and everybody wants to get out and go into the open, just enjoy a few summer months. So you see all these things come into play when it comes into um, determining the number of persons that actually get sick. At one point, people were saying that if it's hot and dry, they will um, blow dry them nose so that they can kill the virus inside. Um, good effort, but no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> It can live on other parts of the body and inside, way to the back of the nose where the blow dry can't reach. So um, please don't do this. It will cause your nose to dry up, crack and bleed. Um, a couple of months ago, there was also uh, the launch of a new product, which is a disinfectant that could stay on a surface and protect it for 90 days. Um, the company said they were working on it for 10 years and finally they had a breakthrough and they were launching it. Is actually, they say it was actually a polymer that can hold a disinfectant and slowly, dis slowly release it. They could spray it on a surface and it would be protected for a long period of time. That, country, that company has since which fallen into disrepute and the product has been withdrawn. And some people may be even worried about their pets, seeing as though quite a number of cats and dogs in China and the USA have been reported to have had COVID. Or they may worry that them pet go to the street and bring back COVID to the house. Mm -hmm. but, but we haven't found this to be widespread. And I um, actually don't know why some people get it and some persons don't get it. Or some dogs, some pets get it and some pets don't get it. But the pet influence on getting it is not as significant as people bungle it up. There is some association of COVID with comorbid conditions, as you know, especially hypertension, heart disease, immunocompromised states like diabetes, cancer, or even the treatment for cancer, um, and other, other states. But the risk of persons with asthma and pregnancy is surprisingly low. So I'm not worried about persons with asthma and pregnancy as much. Except that they keep the medication close. Except that they keep, keep the medication close, close as they always should. Mm -hmm. um, uh, more worried about persons with the um, states that may cause their blood to clot more quickly. And so I'd ask persons with asthma to maintain your regime in any event, but to not worry so much. Um, a lot of people worry, and worrying is, is, is actually <laughs> a worse thing. Sometimes worrying is a worse thing than the disease itself. Why well, the computer changed the slide for me? <laughs> Another thing that the microbiologist taught me is the aerosolization of the fecal virus. So everybody will say, oh, lad, when you actually flush the toilet, it can actually spew up any virus that was in the toilet up into the ear. So you should see me fight in the toilet at work, um, jump out, 
when it time it's time to flush it or if worse are going there I need to flush at work use my foot mm -hmm. I flush it and run out the same time and make sure it's finished flush before I go back inside so things to think about because these things are possible so let us look at some myths while I pass my time <laughs> can I make a more potent disinfectant by combining different ones and the answer is no you can't make it more potent that by mixing it. As a matter of fact, some disinfectant material, um, fluids actually um, counter, each other. counter each other so that they work less if you mix them together. Our infection practices at health facilities actually ask persons to clean with one at a time and allow the appropriate time for it to dry and do its magic. So no, you can't mix them for a better um, disinfectant. Can lemon and bicarbonate tea cure COVID-19 disease? So far, the, the evidence suggests that no, it cannot cure the disease, but it can cause a nice fizz in your mouth. Is it true that sneezing cannot transmit COVID, only coughing? I heard it before. This is false. Sneezing, coughing, um, blowing your nose in public, it can cause COVID. As a matter of fact, if you talk too loud without a face covering, it can spread droplets. And if droplets have COVID in there, it can spread it to other persons if it falls on any of their respiratory surfaces, including the eyes. The eye is a respiratory surface. Just in case you never know, yes, you can say, oh, it's true. All right. And finally, can cold food protect you from getting COVID-19? I love ice cream as much as, much as the next man. Well, no, COVID can't, cold food can't protect you from COVID-19. Let's have a follow. Eh? Eat right, exercise, and take care of all complete. So in summary, life is a balance, truly is. And this is where you will um, practice the things that are necessary and for general hygiene. Generally, we would do these things for hygiene, even if it wasn't COVID, except the face cover. But in real life, supposed to be talking into somebody's face. Um, anyway. So we just have to put all these things into balance. We are information. Don't be too worried. Uh, thank you. We want to thank um, Johans for helping me. Um, he initially wasn't available, but I thought he ably presented the, a lot of information about what we wanted to present. And I'm also going to just do one slide now to bring us up to speed on what's currently happening. Um, he presented a lot about, you know, how the disease first presented, um, you know, what we, what they do behind the scenes in terms of surveillance and how we should conduct ourselves in terms of some of the infection um, control and prevention methods. So just one more slide and I will hand over to my next presenter. So we know that there was a first wave, the curve, we were able to flatten the curve. We didn't have many cases then. Um, not many deaths, um, but since then, um, we've had entered into a new phase. Um, I'm hoping you're able to see at the top of the slide. We've had a resurgence of cases post reopening of the country that happened in June. And now we have cases in every parish. Initially, we did not have cases in every parish. Um, I did some current numbers yesterday because I knew that today it might be tricky. So based on what I got from, I believe it was the WHO website, we had up until yesterday about 4,758 cases with 187 new cases. And I believe in the last 24 hours, we had an additional over 200 cases. Um, total death 60 with five up to yesterday. There are more today. Um, total recovered up to yesterday, 1,327. Currently have, well, right now it's probably about 3,500 active cases with about nine of them being critical. Um, we have just now over, or there are about 20 deaths per, well, we had 20 deaths per 1 million persons in our population up until yesterday. And so with this community transmission, we are advised to try to live with the virus. And it's based on what best research is showing us to be helpful, the controlling of our droplets with the appropriate mask in the various spaces, physical distancing, and other IPC measures like hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. Staying home when you're not feeling well. Um, we are trying to expand testing. So initially, the primary and gold standard test was your nasopharyngeal swab and a test using PCR. 
but there are other methodologies to come, some cheaper and, you know, there are rapid tests, so we should get a better turnaround time in terms of results. Um, unfortunately, not everybody is adhering to all the protocols, so we need to try to encourage each other to do our best, um, you know, in order, in order to continue the spread. So I'll stop there, and if you guys have any questions later, you can let us know. Thank you, Drs. Rodriguez. Um, we have been given quite a lot of information and we're happy, we're thankful to you for having gone through and to bring us all of that information. Let's hope that we have been able to dispel the, the myths that have been going around and that we have a, a clearer understanding of COVID-19. Okay, I think we should move to the next presenter. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, oh, yes, can. All right, we seem to have got some other so as a member of the Holistic Health uh, Committee, we are going to move to our second presenter. And while I'm introducing the speaker, we'll ask her to upload and to share her screen. So Dr. Pauline Williams Green is a family physician in Lindsay St. Catherine and has been serving the community since 1993. She has been a committed Christian since the age of 12 years. She's married to Lloyd and has one son. And she's very passionate about service to the sick, but also loves teaching and mentoring young people. Of course, as you know, Dr. Pauline Williams Green is her own sister Pauline. And we just want to hand over to her now as she presents on managing Thank you so much, Lisa, and I hope Marjorie will be able to get on shortly. So my task is to talk about managing comorbidities. Yeah, it's kind of a mouthful, isn't it? But I hope that as we talk about various elements, you will begin to understand what this is all about. We're going to talk about the superstorm, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, and then we will look at some tips to manage them. Thanks to Johan and Camille, they mentioned that there are some more um, comorbidities and these are just other illnesses. The ones we'll focus on this afternoon 
or rather this evening is of course being overweight or obese, just plain fat. High blood pressure, diabetes and asthma. They mention cancer or treatment with cancer. They also mentioned um, some other problems which cause coagulation. So problems like lupus and other related um, illnesses are also significant comorbidities. But let's just, we just have time for a few. Let's focus now on obesity. So what is the superstorm? It's just like, remember the superstorm, Sandy? Well, when COVID-19 pandemic meets the overfat pandemic, we get the superstorm. So you're fat and fluffy. Is obesity really that bad? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. In Jamaica, more than half of adults are overweight or obese. In fact, these days we call the overweight persons pre-obese. We are on your way. And guess what, women? We literally take the cake. Two thirds of us women, 15 years and older, are pre-obese, overweight, or obese. Fat compromises immune function and reduces our defense mechanisms. We already know that being overweight or fat puts us at risk for other illnesses, asthma, high blood pressure, diabetes, and a whole range of heart diseases causing early deaths. So therefore, persons like with comorbidities are vulnerable to COVID-19 infections because of these pre-existing illnesses. So we are going to look at some of these chronic illnesses, which make us more vulnerable to COVID-19 infections. Pressure, or just plain high blood pressure, hypertension. It's well known as the silent killer. Blood pressure equal to or above 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury is high blood pressure. It's very common as we get older, which is why older persons are so susceptible. If not controlled, it leads to strokes, kidney disease, heart attacks, heart failure, and trust me, the list goes on. Now, COVID-19 and uncontrolled blood pressure is a dangerous duo. The National Health Fund has been telling us to know our numbers. If our systolic pressure is equal to or less than 120, and the diastolic less than equal to or less than 80, we're fine. Anything above is high. And the higher you go is the more dangerous it is for persons with high blood pressure. Let's move on to diabetes. Now diabetes, sugar occurs when the sugar or glucose in your blood reaches very high levels. Normal levels are anywhere around five to six millimoles per liter. And our picture shows someone testing their own sugar. You can do it for yourself. Uncontrolled blood glucose increases the chances of leg amputations, blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, stroke, and it gets worse as you go along. It's a terrible way to die. Now, COVID-19 and diabetes is a deadly duo as well. It's a dangerous combination as well. Let's move on to asthma. I'm happy to hear Johan say that our Jamaican experience has not demonstrated a great, a terrible risk for asthma, but it's still a chronic reversible inflammatory disease 
with attacks of coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath. And while asthmatics should not terrify themselves with fear, it is, they are still vulnerable to COVID-19 since the virus attacks the respiratory system. And of course, smokers and chronic obstructive airway disease is terrible combination too. Smoking increases the chances of other chronic illnesses such as heart disease, gangrene of the feet, premature death, just bad news. And without a doubt, smokers are at risk of severe complications from COVID-19. So let me not wait to get to the end. I'm going to say it now. Smokers need to stop or at least seek help in stopping their smoking habit and addiction. When COVID-19 meets the couch potato, who is that? Someone who eats over too much and unhealthy foods, too much salt, too much sugar, very little fiber. And we know that unhealthy eating is responsible for early deaths too. COVID-19 may just push you over the edge. Lack of exercise leads to also leads to early deaths. And therefore, we need to address this. Excess alcohol can lead to early deaths as well. COVID-19 will help to push you over the cliff. So COVID-19 is devastating for the inactive, the ones who eat poorly, and the alcohol abuser. So what have I said so far? COVID-19 puts persons with chronic illnesses at greater risk of serious infection. And what can we do? We're not going to go down in defeat. We're going to fight this. And in fact, it's an opportunity to improve our health. Yes, let's eat healthy, more fiber. Before you consume anything, think, how much fiber does it have? It's usually, usually healthier the more fiber. Sweet, our tubers, sweet potato, yams, um, our brown rice, whole wheat bread. Let's go for the, not, the least processed and the foods with more fiber. And of course, vegetables, your pulses, your beans, your legumes, and your fruits. Guess what? Exercise is good for us. So despite the instruction to tan a yard, let's run around the yard and get lots of sunshine. Studies are showing that the vitamin D deficiency may facilitate the COVID-19 infection. So let's get as much sunshine. It's free here in Jamaica and let's do the exercise. And yes, visit your favorite family physician, general practitioner, health practitioner. And we need to manage control if we can't cure our chronic conditions, which means take your medication, please. Yes, take them on time, regularly, not when you remember or when you feel like, take them as prescribed. And yes, check your blood pressure, check your blood sugar and do the right thing. I never leave out divine intervention. It helps to calm the mind when I connect with my creator and my, the supreme being that has a purpose for me, brought me here. So let's not leave that out as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams Green. Again, a lot of information to us, and we thank you for People are not sure what it means, and I think you have given us a very clear Thank you. Thank you until the end of the presentation. Move on to our next presenter.
Well, our next presenter is um, Dr. Lisa Bromfield, who again is one of our best members. Uh, she's going to give us an update on the COVID vaccines and keeping, how do we keep up with real immunization? So sorry, I don't have Marjorie. So, Dr. Marjorie. Lisa. Sister Dr. Marjorie. Dr. Lisa. Yes, I'm hearing you. I'll I'll I'm read not... Lisa's bio. Yes. Yes. I'll read. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Our sister Please, Lisa is a pharmacist with over 20 years of experience. And her area of expertise includes, includes clinical skills in infectious diseases. In 2017, she received further certification in pharmacy based in pharmacy-based immunization delivery by the American Pharmacists Association. She's a passionate, she's passionate about teaching and is currently a lecturer at University of Technology. Go ahead, Sister Lisa. Thank you, Sister Joan. Um, brothers and sisters, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We hear you. All right, it's a pleasure for me to um, participate in our Healing Sunday Health Forum and to bring you an update on the COVID-19 vaccines and the importance of keeping up with regular immunizations during the outbreak. So in the next 15 minutes, which I'll spend with you, just to discuss vaccination as a strategy to prevent infections, to look at the importance of continuing routine vaccination, even during the COVID-19 outbreak, as uh, Sister Kini says, it is something that we are going to learn to live with. What is in our future in terms of preventing this virus by vaccination and what is in the pipeline in terms of the vaccines that are being developed. So let's take a look at vaccination as a strategy to prevent infections first. So what's a vaccine? Um, simply put, a vaccine really contains the same germ that causes the disease. For example, the flu vaccine contains the flu virus tetanus contains the tetanus bacteria. And you may say then, if that is so, why would I want to take it? But really and truly a vaccine, the virus or bacteria is either killed or it's weakened so that it is able to generate an immune response or to cause your body to create an immune response, but it is not able to make you sick. And in other vaccines that have been developed, they use a part of the germ. So a part of the germ instead of the entire germ, which means that when we get that vaccine, the body is able to recognize it as being foreign. Now that this virus or bacteria doesn't belong. And what the vaccine does is to stimulate your own immune system or trigger your immune system to produce proteins that we call antibodies. And these antibodies will then be able to fight the disease. The good thing about vaccines as well is that it creates a memory. So your body is able to recognize the bacteria or the virus if you are exposed to it again. And if you are exposed to it again, your immune system will be able to destroy the virus or the bacteria. So in other words, the vaccine works with our body's natural defenses to be able to build protection. And we've had many successes with vaccines. For many of you who have had children who had to uh, carry your child to the clinic or to the private pediatrician, then you would recognize that these vaccines are very, very important in terms of preventing other infections. And we've had a lot of success. In December last year, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of eradicating smallpox. 
which killed 300 million people in the 20th century alone. And we have seen success with polio. So we are not seeing persons walking around um, paralyzed from polio disease. Well, we haven't seen any in Jamaica, um, but at least it has been reduced around the world, world by at least 99% and averting 18 million irreversible paralysis and saving 1.5 million children's lives. We've seen other success with vaccines. We've seen it eliminate neonatal tetanus in some parts of the world. We've seen a reduction in the hepatitis B virus infection. We've seen reduction in measles, mumps, and rubella. And interestingly, Dr. Rodriguez mentioned influenza. And we have seen influenza pandemics around the world. And one of the strategies or the major strategy in controlling influenza is in fact by immunization. So what is the challenge that we're facing right now? So we are having a COVID-19 pandemic, but there are other infectious diseases which we don't want for that routine immunization to be interrupted because it means then that we may be dealing with other diseases apart from the COVID-19 outbreak. So UNICEF and CDC is basically saying that because the global pandemic is overstretching the health system, our healthcare workers are overworked. Some of them are getting sick. And as a result of this focus, essential services and vaccine services have been disrupted in some countries. And this is following the implementation of the social distancing measures. And this could potentially increase the risk of other disease outbreaks. There are some persons who have been unable to access healthcare for regular immunization around the world. And like many of us here in Jamaica, we are even afraid to attend our healthcare services due to the fear of contracting the virus. So the consequences of this is that it is possible for children not to be getting their critical vaccines and it leaves them therefore susceptible to diseases that we know that we can prevent. Right now, many of us are being quarantined or children are mainly at home, school opens in October. And so once you have a restriction movement being lifted, there is a danger of the spread of these illnesses. So what is the message we want to leave with you? Make sure that children receive or continue to receive their routine immunizations. Very, very important. But the focus is not just on children because as adults, there are some vaccines that we are required to get to protect our health. And uh, again, coming up in October, we begin the influenza season. And the CDC, World Health Organization, has recommended that the flu vaccine should be an essential part of protecting your health and your family's health this season. If you look at Dr. Pauline's uh, presentation, she talked about many chronic illnesses and Dr. Rodriguez reinforced that even though asthmatics are not you know, top of mind in terms of risk, there are other chronic illnesses that pose a threat for these patients if they get COVID-19. The same is true for influenza. So for influenza, persons with of any age that have these comorbidities and are at increased risk of complications, for our elderly population over 65, for our healthcare workers who are on the front line, the idea is that we need to keep the burden of respiratory illnesses down and influenza is in fact a respiratory illness. So it's very, very important that we think about whether or not you are in fact part of this higher risk population and to ensure that these immunizations are completed. All of course, while following 
the preventative measures. So make sure when you go to the clinic that it's spaced, you have your distancing, you do your proper hygiene, disinfecting, hand washing, etc. So what is it about the world? I don't know if much about if you watch the international news, but you would see a lot of discussion about the vaccine. They've been bringing it on on our local news as well, talking about preventing COVID-19 by vaccination. And there is a race, of course, on to see which pharmaceutical company will be the first to actually be able to bring their vaccine. And the reason is that right now, we are doing aggressive implementation of suppression strategies. So as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned, we are quarantining, isolation, contact tracing, social distancing, doing our um, case identifications. Dr. Camille talked about the different tests to be able to get uh, faster results. So those are some of the strategies that we have been implementing. But she also mentioned that with the opening of the ports, what we are now seeing is an increase in the number of cases. And this is exactly what the World Health Organization is saying, that even though we are implementing these strategies, the challenge is that when we reopen society and the interventions are relaxed, or as you can see, Dr. Toms, uh, Dr. Camille said, uh, there's, it's not everyone who is obeying the uh, requirements. So it is not a long-term strategy. It is a strategy for now because we don't have a vaccine. And I was really taken aback. Uh, Dr. Camille gave us some local statistics and I usually check on the World Health Organization dashboard as well. And I remember checking it in August, about August 10th, and we had 19 million confirmed cases. Today, we are now at over 30 million. So it is real, it is something that we're going to have to live with. And what the leaders in immunizations are saying is that the development as a vaccine, of a vaccine has to be a priority for ending the pandemic. And it is the way to provide effective immunity. And what we need, however, is a well-tested vaccine that is safe and a vaccine that is in fact effective. So Dr. Rodriguez spoke about um, antibodies being produced after a natural infection. The idea is that after the vaccine, we want to have antibodies being produced that will be long lasting and so preventing the infection. So what is in the pipeline? Uh, as I said, the race is very um, aggressive and there are a lot of um, pharmaceutical companies that are in the running. But just to share with you a little tip, did you know that the coronavirus pathogen got its name due to its spiky crown? And this is important because the vaccines in development are basically using these proteins on the outer surface of the virus to develop the product that will be able to trigger your immune response and produce antibodies. So there are companies like Moderna and Pfizer who are in the race. They are using what is called an RNA genetic material. So this material, you know, our genetic material uh, codes for different things, right? So this particular genetic material that they're using from the coronavirus will instruct our body to make proteins and we will generate an immune response to those proteins or produce antibodies to those proteins. And so if we're exposed to the coronavirus, then we should not become infected. Notice I said should not, because all vaccines are not 100% effective. Johnson & Johnson AstraZeneca is also in the race. And they're also using genetic material. 
And what they have done is to attach the genetic material from the COVID-19 virus to another virus called the adenovirus, which causes the common cold. Again, remember, these vaccines will produce an immune response against the COVID-19, the spike protein, but is not, should not cause the infection itself, right? So Johnson & Johnson is using a, an adenovirus, a human vector, we call it a shuttle. So in other words, to help the genetic material to get to our immune system, they use a vector to shuttle it. And they are using different vectors in different vaccine strategies. Um, also sure you've been hearing about Sputnik V, the Russia's, Russia's coronavirus vaccine. And I remember when it came on the news, um, Putin said that, um, you know, it's past regulatory approval and it's ready for production and he's going to start uh, immunizing his um, government uh, persons, etc., cetera. Um, caused quite a stir and a lot of skepticism because the vaccine was only being tested for two months. And then finally, in closing, uh, the Sanofi GlaxoSmithKline vaccine, they're also using uh, genetic material again, and they're combining that ge genetic material with another agent, which we call an adjuvant. And what it does is to make the protein a little bit bigger and causes the immune system to give a more robust response or a stronger response and is expected to give longer lasting immunity. The question on everybody's mind is, which vaccine will work? Which vaccine will be effective? Which vaccine will be safe? There are different approaches, which have different strengths and different weaknesses. And maybe more than one approach will work. But until we have the clinical trials completed, we will not know for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Sister. Hello, are you hearing me? Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Sister, Sister Bromfield. Um, we're eagerly awaiting the vaccines, even though we've heard so many um, concerns raised about which vaccine would be most reliable. And all of those things you mentioned about efficacy and um, testing and so on have been going around, as we all know, for quite a lot of debate. Some people are saying we will not accept those vaccines, and there are so many myths. But let us hope that in due time, we will find the right one, and we will be able to get some relief from this virus. Thank you so much, Sister Lisa. Um, in the interest of time, we're moving on, and we're doing very good with our timekeeping. Thank you to all the presenters so far. We are now at the final presentation. The topic here is help for parents Help for parents guiding children in the COVID-19 teaching learning environment. And this is a very timely presentation as we approach the reopening of schools in a very short time. So we'd like to welcome our sister, Car um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> our sister, Colleen Bisnott, who is an educator, has been an educator for over 30 years and has worked both at the secondary and the primary levels of the education system in Jamaica. For the last 12 years, she has had the responsibility to lead the mission of VAS Preparatory School, a well-known private institution that caters to children between the ages of 11 to 12 years old. 
inclusive of children presenting with mild to moderate learning challenges. These experiences working with a wide cross section of students have helped her to shape her thoughts and guiding principles about educating young minds. She brings this wealth of inf information to us this evening and she will help us to understand better how we can cope with our children and to guide them in preventing COVID-19 and all the challenges we face. So let us welcome Sister Carleen Bisnott. Thank you. And um, it's, it's, it's good to be here sharing in this forum this evening. And um, just for clarity, there are schools that have started already, even though technically speaking, school begins on the 5th of October, several schools, several private schools, including mine, and some of the high schools have begun online already. So um, I must tell you though, that having had this wealth of information shared this evening, it has also helped to fuel some of my concerns and my fears about school reopening in October and just how ready we are for that. Even though most of our, 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 our school leaders are giving serious thought to having a blended approach when we reopen or when, we, when it, the school term officially begins, because we are mindful that the cases continue and uh, more and more households become, our communities become affected and hence the children become more vulnerable in those areas. Be that as it may, we still need to prepare for that. And so I do have some tips that I wanted to share with you. Thanks also to Auntie Betty, who assisted with a lot of this research for this evening. And I'm to some of these tips. So we're managing children in the COVID-19 teaching and learning setting. All of this is as a newness which awakes within us a desire to be empowered to tackle the new challenges which face us. A sense of accomplishment as you battle these, these elements and a positive outlook in everything that arises. It's a new school year, new beginning, new way of learning, new way of operating. And so we have to condition our minds for this mindset because it is indeed a mindset that it's not only for parents, for us as teachers, and for the students as well. We all have to begin to, to, to shift the way we thought that education could only happen and to be open to exploring other, other ways that we can achieve this. So we, we are beginning a new school year and most schools have begun online with virtual school preparing our minds for this we have to become more optimistic see the bright side of everything recognize the opportunity in every adversity um sometimes it's difficult to see that because the challenges sometimes outweigh the 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 opportunities but we still have to look for them anyway discuss changes with children to make the transition easier it's really a completely different way of operating and they really are not enjoying it because they really and truly miss interacting with their friends. And we also need to ensure that immunizations are up to date, as mentioned earlier, to ensure that we are they are protected as much as they possibly can. So we have changes that we have to bear in mind. What are some of these changes? We're going to have, well, some persons already have experienced the virtual orientation for school and have begun virtual classes. Um, parents have had to make special arrangements to ensure that the children are adequately supervised at home, have had to invest in technology to ensure that they have a device with which to access the online classes, and um, children now have to appreciate the, <laughs> and it's, it's easier said than done, There's no more hugging and kissing, no more playing outside with friends, no more large gatherings. 
and they really do have a hard time adjusting to those aspects and we have as adults have to help walk them through those areas because they it, it affects their thinking it affects sometimes just how they sometimes it affects the learning process because they become so anxious that they know and they are no longer in a position to learn so we have to help them through that process too and as as as, in, as institutions as learning institutions I know um, several of us as, as, as school leaders have put in place opportunities for the children to vent and to, to share how they feel because that's very important and, um, and then to guide them through how to manage those feelings. Preparing for school, we need to find a special place to set up an area at home for school without any surround noise. It really needs to be a noise-free zone and also to be set up in such a way that there are maybe some learning material that is in the area, charts, whatever, just to give the feel of school and, and also to, to provide um, points of reference for the students when they're at home. They would have had these in their classrooms around them um, as, as, as a way of scaffolding them in their learning process. We encourage you as parents to set up those kind of areas at home for school so that they can have their tables are there, their, their parts of speech are there, whatever it is that is, um, it might be a map of the world that's there so that they have that as a point of reference. That they go to that special place now with the required books and all the school resources. So in most of the online, classes, there is a timetable that is used and we encourage um, that the children become organized and that they have the books that they need for each day, have them all together in one place. Um, and all the other school resources, your dictionary, your pencils, your rubber, your, all the things that they need so that they don't have to be getting up ever so often to get to something. Their water bottles should be very close at hand, either under the chair or very close at hand with their water bottles filled with cool enough water to keep them occupied so that they also don't have to be moving from, from, their, from their area too often. They do get breaks as, they, as, as the day progresses. And um, we ask that if possible, some, some form of timer be in that space to indicate when breaks are over as you know that if you if you allow them to the breaks go on unended so they need to to be become responsible to the to the timer just like how we have at the bell at school ringing to say it's time now for for um the break time has ended we would want to um replicate that in the space that you have at home and then encourage them to do all their conversations with family members before school begins and not while school is going on. Just to just add to, to that now, um, those persons who are going to be at home in the space of the children, to be mindful that the cameras are on and picking up everything that's going on in the background. So however you are dressed and whatever you are doing um, in, in passing by the cameras, cameras are picking up. And so as, as, as um, adults, we have to be mindful of how we are operating the space so that we are not points of distraction during the teaching learning process. During school time, encourage children to be punctual by logging on on time. Five minutes before class begins that they are in the waiting room waiting to be admitted. Listen carefully to all instructions given Ask questions if something is unclear. Participate actively in class. Complete all assignments. Communicate with teachers when you are kicked off. And make sure to catch up on work that has been missed. And then after school, you are encouraged to review what was done. Complete all the assignments, your homework assignments. Maintain social distance, but converse with your friends. And sometimes what we do as educators too is at the end of the day, we allow them some time online to interact with, the, with their friends, um, reminding them that we are in their hearing, we are hearing what is, because we are facilitating that, we are hearing what is happening, but giving them that opportunity to interact with their friends. And they do appreciate that too. Play a physical game or go for a walk around the house. 
well, some of the schools also include in their offerings on the online um, physical engagement through PE or movement, whatever it is, so that there is some form of exercise that goes on throughout the week so that they are not just sitting before the computer all day. And at the ending of the day, we encourage them to eat well rest of the following day and to um, pay attention to prayer, prayer being uh, their guide, both in the mornings, during the day, and at night. That's all of that is about virtual school. Then we now need to, be, to take our minds to preparing for returning to school face to face. Um, many schools have been mandated to have specific protocols in place. We've been given guidelines to work with to ensure that um, the children will be as safe as possible while they're in the in the school environment. And I'll just stop to share a little bit about that with you. The, the hand washing stations, the um, availability of hand washing, regular hand washing, ease of hand washing during the day, um, the hand sanitizing and um, temperature checks, all of those things have to be put in place, including um, having an isolation room in the event that anything should surface while, while school is taking place. Um, all of those things have to be in place. Um, regular sanitizing of the spaces, um, including the bathrooms and the regular, regularly touched areas. Um, and then insisting that, that the students come with their masks and that the adults who are on the compound are also wearing their masks. And so moving into that now, children are being encouraged while at home to practice wearing the masks at home, starting with 15 minutes, building it up half an hour, one hour, two hours, till they get accustomed to having it on for the length of time that they will need to have it on while they're at school. They will get mask breaks that will take them on the outside and they'll be allowed to remove the masks for a while and then put them back on. But they need to get into the habit of keeping the masks on. Even as adults, we have to do so too. Um, so we need to get masks that are, that, they, that are comfortable for them, but they will but they constantly tugging at and, and trying to adjust because it's not fitting right. And they need at least four each day. Um, so if it is, it is rainy season now, and if they are washable ones, you need to be mindful that they must be washed daily and dried properly. So encouraging you to collect as at least six to 12 for each child in the household so that they, they are that you have an adequate supply of masks. And um, the, the, what is that one now? The blue ones, can't remember the term that they used to describe them now, the surgical masks, right? Those, as much as they are handy, they, it, it, it tends to add up, the cost tends to add up when you have to purchase them on a regular basis. So we I know that many of the schools are going branded masks. Um, so I encourage you to invest in some of those so that they, they have them for school. We also encourage parents to put together a personal kit with hand sanitizer, liquid soap, wet wipes, extra mask in a Ziploc bag. And please bear in mind that the hand sanitizers should have the correct percentage of alcohol in there and ensure that um, they do not have too many other additives that might have adverse effects as well. Um, there are some, some brands that, that tend to have, that have become quite popular in terms of fitting the, all the guidelines and ask that you do your research and ensure that you are providing um, hand sanitizers that are of that can stand the scrutiny of the Bureau of Standards. Have their own supply of school resources so that they don't have to borrow in class. And it's very important that they they don't have to share any of their, I will call them their school utensils, so that we don't have any cross movement of any in, 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 in any way at all. The idea really is when they get into the schools is to keep them in their space, whatever space they are going to be in, they will remain in that space for, for most of the day. 
and um, we want to ensure that they they keep as safe as possible within that space. Practice all the physical and social distancing requirements as set up in the schools, um, which in, involve um, what they call bubbles or, 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 or their safe spaces. And also in some schools that have implemented some one-way systems to prevent um, too much interaction between the students and to label all personal items and um, encourage them not to not to not to share masks and to try masks and to uh, interchange masks one or the other. Um, share with them the dangers of doing that. And so, COVID nineteen is a new experience for all of us, teachers, parents, students, and we can work at making these new experiences fun rather than frustrating. And um, it's something that we have to keep working at. So when at first you don't succeed, you try and you try again um, because it's, it's a work in progress. And as, as we go along, we tweak and we, we ensure that the idea is that safety comes first. And so the safety of our children is, is paramount. And we want to ensure that we do all that we can, both as parents and as the school environment to protect them. Plan fun activities at home to engage them in um, board games, outdoor games, watching movies and discussing plots and scenes, and also the whole matter of the how, the when, the why, the where and the what ifs as we, we build the kind of conversations that are important for PEP um, so that they're not just watching for watching's sake, but they are, are watching and learning as they are watching. And then to remind ourselves that this too will pass Sometimes I wonder how long it's going to take to pass, but the point is that it will pass. And then some, some other reminders for us, you are stronger than you, real, you realize, you are more capable than you imagine. And sometimes I have to remind myself of those exact words as we navigate the storm of COVID-19. Your storms are only temporary, but the blessings of God last forever. Count your blessings, name them one by one and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. So as parents, just do what all I can to keep them safe. And we at school will also do what we can to keep them safe as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sister Carleen. And we know now how we can help our children to adjust to this COVID-19 pandemic as they go back to school and as they interact with each other, even outside of the school setting. I agree with the point that you can start helping them to adjust to the, the mask before they even go back to school. So they get, um, you know, they're not too frustrated with it. And so I want to thank all the, all the presenters and ask that you now make ready for the question and answer session, section where um, participants are given a chance to ask questions. Remember participants, in order to ask a question, you click on the participant button at the bottom of your screen and then click on the raise hand button at the bottom right hand corner, wait to be acknowledged, and then pose your question. Unmute your microphone, of course. And if you choose to use your camera when asking a question, be sure it is in a stable right. position and focused at eye level. Ensure also that there are no distractions behind the camera. Thank you so much. Can we have your questions now, please? Um, good evening, everybody. Hello. Hi, good evening. Can you hear you? Is this Maria? Yeah, I can, I can hear you now, yeah. So I, I'm just curious. I heard Carleen say that we don't know how long this thing went to last. I just want to ask a question and then just make a comment. 
How long did the Spanish flu last? Anybody knows that? I'm not aware, but I can do a quick, quick check. Oh, you did a quick check while I, <laughs> I, I, I share like a dream. I had a, like a dream the other day that we were all at, like at a medical conference or something in a big building, right? And um, in that big building, nobody was social distancing, nobody had on a mask, but everybody, everybody had aged 10 years. I know not what it means. You get the answer yet? <laughs> for the Spanish flu? All right. Yes, yes, okay. the... It lasted from February 1918 to uh -huh. April 1920. So it looks like two, two, years. About two years plus. Two years plus, yeah, two plus two months. All right. So um, I, I'm not sure how many persons remember that Al Dr. Alfred does had said something about salt and um, using even tissue paper as filters. Yes. Um, I was curious to know from how effective you find cloth masks to be? Because, you know, some of them might have two layers, some might have three, and people tell you all kinds of manners and ways in which they make them. But um, I, I have determined that cloth masks for me aren't all that effective. I tend to use the blue ones that Carlene couldn't remember the name of. But there's something else I also do because I said to myself, if the, if the doctor could recommend that if you don't have the coffee filters and so and soak them in the salt water or, or the tissue papers, the two blocks and soak them in the salt water. I personally don't know how long this thing will last. I personally don't have a lot of money to be buying masks all the time. So what I have been doing with even the blue ones is washing them in soap water, rinsing them out in fresh water, soaking them in a solution of salt water and then hang them out to dry. And I re have recycled them a couple of times well. And it works quite fine. Um, I use a very soft brush, not a toothbrush or anything like that. And additionally, um, be before I decided that um, the cloth ones aren't so wonderful, I also do the same thing with the cloth ones. I, I will wash them in, in regular soapy water, rinse them out in fresh water, and soak them in salt water and then put them to dry. So I don't know what, 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 what the doctors think of that. I don't know what they thought of what Dr. Alfred Dawes had said in the first place or any of our participants. I see one or two who could possibly answer the question. Yeah, I am willing to start. Um, okay. All right. So the use of the mask, as far as I understand it, is to be done in tandem with a number of other measures. So we know that physical distancing is also important. The mask, well, the various masks do different things. So the cloth mask is really just for source control, meaning to cut down on the amount of droplets that's released from uh, a given person. And that in combination with social distancing should prevent transfer even, well, we, we can't guarantee complete um, cessation of droplets, but to a significant degree, if everybody wears the mask. So it becomes challenging when not everybody wears the mask, Worse, if there are uh, processes occurring that can result in aerosolization of the virus. But of course, most of those processes occur in hospital. The surgical mask, which I think is the blue one you're referring to, and even the N95 are medical masks, which don't just do source control. They actually do some amount of filtration and offers. So, okay, the regular cloth mask protects the other person mainly protects the other person from the wearer's droplets. The medical mask, the surgical and N95 mask, they do that, but in addition, they also protect the wearer because they do some amount of filtration. The N95 does the most, and then the surgical mask would fall below that. If you can afford and you can get the surgical mask, fine, I know they are selling them in pharmacies, the concern though was that um, because of worldwide shortages that persons were encouraged to reserve those masks or leave those masks for uh, the healthcare setting and use the regular cloth masks and social distancing for day-to-day -day activities. But the truth is that they are expected to perform better than the regular cloth masks. A lot of data abound and research abound in terms of reprocessing the mask. There is a danger though that after a certain number of attempts at reprocessing or cleaning the surgical masks, 
that the efficacy of the filtration will you know, wane or the, the material will no longer be as effective with each processing done or each time you wash it. They weren't really meant for that. They were they're, they're meant for single use. Out of desperation though, persons have put forward suggestions about measures that can be done in desperate circumstances to try and reprocess them. But I just wanted to put a caution there that there are limitations with that. Um, so I hope I answered most of the, of the questions. Salt um, the salt filters now are expected to do something because the salt is expected to some degree um, to have some antimicrobial activity. I haven't seen much though in terms of publications. I don't think it has been studied very well for us to give you any sort of scientific data, but it is mm. an added layer of protection and it's mm. cheap and it is affordable. So it can be mm. used in combination if you know, you're doing the day-to-day -day sort of run. So it, does, so it doesn't hurt what Dr. Alfred does said then, you know, if you don't have the official filters, you can just use two blocks of um, in my opinion it doesn't soak it in salt water put it in your mask and yeah your memory, right? yeah in my opinion it doesn't hurt and it, and it wouldn't hurt either to what to, to rig to do a final rinse of your cloth mask and salt water either. no it doesn't hurt it doesn't hurt i mean um i know that okay washing with soap and water first and then soaking in a bleach solution one part uh supermarket or household bleach to and then you add nine parts water to that is a very good um, way to disinfect your mask, soaking them for at least 15 minutes. And then, you know, that alone should be adequate. But if you want to then, after it has been dry, dried, if you want to then try to soak it in salt, okay, fine, because then the crystals will be left in it when it dries. Right, because the, so, so it's not disinfecting so much the salt water as, um, I think what Alfred does was saying is that the crystals right. themselves can destroy the, the virus. Right, right. The Leo. Right. Right. So that, that's a little different still. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. I'd just like to add a little thing, um, not so much the disinfectant aspect, but persons do have um, concerns with wearing the mask. So, Khalid, I was happy um, that you talked about the children wearing four masks for the day because they do get very sweaty. On the, not the children, all of us, we get sweaty underneath, and I'm seeing persons with rashes as a result. So it's a good idea to to um, to change the mask, the mask frequently, and uh, there are persons who will react to the mass, depending on what the material is. So we have to be alert to that. Thank you. Um, just one point about the mass. I've heard of stories where some schools have apparently prepared their own um, specially designed masks, and they, they are apparently very expensive. So parents are finding it difficult to afford them. and and. It, it appears or it sounds as if the schools are insisting that the children wear those specially provided masks. What, what's your take on that? Can anyone answer to that? I, 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 I hmm. well, I can speak to my school and, and we do not insist. We have them available. Um, if they need, they are there, but we, we would not necessarily say you have to buy those. Um, I'm not sure what obtains in other schools, but I, I would not want to get to that place where I'm, I am making it mandatory. Um, we could ask that they, they um, support the cause. Um, having, had the, having had gone to the lengths of having them prepared for use, but I don't know that that might be it being mandatory is the way to go. That is, that's my opinion. Thank you. And uh, if I may and, add, may I add something, um, Nurse Ming? Yes, the the other ahead. thing Stop. is ensuring that the mask fit properly. So I'm not sure how many different properly. sizes. Right. You, the, the school has because you have to be careful. Some persons are wearing the mask under the nose and it needs to cover both the nose and the mouth and fit properly. 
around the air. Those people, I, I know I experienced it as well. The persons who wear glasses, when the mask meets the, the band, it, it, it is a problem. So wearing properly fitted masks is what's important, not so much supporting a school's effort. Thank you so much, I do agree. Do we have any other questions? We have a hand up from yes, Rachel. Some hands that are up. We have an, a hand up from Rachel Irving and then Monique Savage Williams. Rachel? Uh, Rachel, your mic is muted. Are you able to unmute? Can you hear me? Yes, can we can hear you now. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, about the death rate, I'm a little bit worried, uh, especially in those with comorbidity. What are we doing wrong at this stage? We had a lower death rate in the past three weeks. It has increased twofold mm -hmm. is it that we are not picking them up early i hear if you know the d my um the the dimer rate is up then your it's indicate um you know a bad outcome what are we doing wrong at this stage all right because i'm a little bit worried well we are um... Um, not so sure if the death rate that is up, or just the numbers, or absolute numbers are have increased, and so the percentage of um, or the proportion of persons who will die will proportionately increase. Now we will, we actually have to do an investigation of each death because a person is called a COVID-related death when they die, and they're tested positive. It doesn't really mean that the COVID caused the death. It's just um, when they have COVID, you know, they have an additional set of persons called coincidental deaths, where we don't see COVID related to their death at all. Um, these are people who have been gunshot wound victims who happen to test COVID as part of our general hospital surveillance, but we test all persons. Um, that have that foot with a certain criteria and hospital of admissions, but if they have to do surgery, they have comorbid conditions, immunocompromisation or, or immune uh, deficiency, and then of course we test test all persons who die. So it's, it's a contribution of the increased number of cases plus our sensitivity in testing persons who have died. I, and I beg to disagree. I've done the calculation. I've done the calculation and we have increased. I've done the calculations and we have increased. It means that something is wrong a little bit. And the doctors probably are overwhelmed. Probably at this stage, we probably need more infectious disease specialists or older persons who probably can manage. But these older persons are also at risk because they have comorbidity. So I'm wondering if, if there is some study being done um, to look at why we are having this tick up. I'm not saying we are not trying our best, but what can we do to have a tick down? Some of our presenters would like to respond. So um, there's a there's a part arm of the ministry um, that is dedicated to research. There are quite a number of um, research proposals that are uh, on the way or that are planned for COVID-19 um, and the clinical associations. But just to know a lot of our deaths, when you look at the investigation, I can tell you, I, I don't think it's a failure of our healthcare team or our approach to, to, to giving them care. A lot of persons, um, if they die and they're coming up with they would have been ill and recovered and doing well 
and if they're founded later on. Um, but I can't agree say that after the, the, the case fatality rate is increasing because we haven't started to study the case fatality rate as well. The case fatality rate measures the number of deaths among persons who are positive. And remember, we don't have a, we don't know how many persons are positive because we're not testing everybody. We're only testing persons who fill, fulfill a certain criteria. So it's 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 um it's difficult it's it's not inconclusive to say that the, the, the case fatality rate or the death rate is going up. The number of deaths it has increased, the number of persons that we found positive have increased have increased, but we're not testing everybody. So we can't say that the rate is going up. If I may add something, or rather that's a comment. I remember early on when Dr. Karen Webster Carr spoke. She spoke of at least a million persons getting COVID eventually. So we, we won't really know the figures until the end, uh, when the epidemic is over. Is that the, isn't that the approach? I'm just wondering. We'll never really know because we're not doing an incident study. Um, we're not testing everybody. We only can test so many persons because of limitations in testing. Only unless you do incidents, that means you test everybody. Uh, or prevalence, you need to test persons repeatedly over time to find out if it was here. Although prevalence doesn't apply to an acute disease. You won't really know um, the death rate. Yet we have to do a case fatality rate at this sense. Of all the persons who we've tested, what percentage um, that are positive die. But because we, we're very sensitive in terms of our, we have a different surveillance for deaths altogether, we'll be very sensitive in picking up deaths as opposed to picking up cases. So it's kind of difficult at this time. And, and, and we have discussions each morning um, in our emergency operations center meeting and PAHO just started to do case fatality rates. And Jamaica really uh, would have to we have to do some approaches to find out the case we are to reach, but we're not there so and I don't know if we'll ever I don't know if we can, I don't want to comment on mortality rates or case we are to rates because it's kind of difficult with the way we are testing right now. Thank you. Can we hand over um, Sister Marjorie to Monique Savage Williams? We have four persons waiting to ask questions. Yeah, go ahead, please. Good evening, everyone. Very good presentation and informative. My only regret is that I came in a little late. So I just wanted to know if a recommendation was given in terms of the multivitamins that person should be taking at this time to boost their immune system. So I heard mention of vitamin D. But is there anything else? So let me just tell you what's in my home pharmacy at this time that I take every day and if there are any implications of that mix. So I take vitamin C, 1,500 milligrams, 50 milligrams of zinc, omega-3, 600 milligrams of calcium, and 500 milligrams of magnesium with vitamin D3. So I wanted to know if... That is a good mix. If there's something I should avoid from that mix, or is there a recommended combination of vitamins that person should be taken as a means of improving their immune system? <laughs> Dr. William. I'm, I'm always very cautious. <laughs> um, it's spectrum, Monique. There's one end that says all of those vitamins just gets flushed down the tiles <laughs> every time you pass urine. <laughs> wow. And, and there's the other end that says without this, I would be dead, you know. Uh, what, looking at my readings, and this is cancer studies. This is actually based on cancer studies. And what they found was that um, those vitamins, et cetera, unless there's a definite deficiency in that person. Um, it, it works best. Those, those elements work best when eaten, when they come in the food. 
when they come in the combination. So although we know selected elements are excellent for A, B, or C, unless they are found in the group, the, the, the actual food itself or drink or whatever, they don't work as well. That's cancer studies. So I leave all of this viral stuff to, to Camille and Johan. Um, but yes, they're found, they're, they are people who are asking, why are the persons in the South, in the warmer weather, why are they doing so well? And there's some link with vitamin D, yes. Now, if you take vitamin D, there's no guarantee it's going to work. We know if you take sunshine, okay? So all I can say is if you think it works for you, um, I give you your multivitamin, go ahead and try. Just remember there are toxic levels, so don't overdo it. But most of it really goes down into the toilet, to be quite honest. Just to add what Dr. Um, Williams mentioned, um, what is also important, Monique, is nutrition, as she said, uh, getting proper rest, making sure that you exercise, managing your stress levels so do whatever it takes to uh, do your meditations etc because all of these things if you are not doing it will add to inflammation in the body and affects the immune system right um, you want to eat right of course because you also want to avoid um, the onset of chronic illnesses too if you have um, a family history a strong family history of these conditions. So get your regular checkups, your nutrition, as Dr. Williams Green says. The nutritionists in my office say the same thing, Dr. Paul, Sister Polly, that it is the, the diet that's very important. Exercise, rest, manage your stress levels. Very important at this time. Thank you. Thank you. We have other, other questions, Sister Lisa. Yes, we do. Uh, Kenneth Wilson. Good evening, everyone. Good I want to I want to congratulate the presenters. You know, excellent presentations and the information is so good. Um, I'm having a little internet problem, so I won't stay long. But my um, concern really is, I heard the MOH Dr. Uh, McKenzie um, mentioned this week that at the workplace, if someone is showing symptoms of the COVID, uh, the person should be sent home and the area sanitized and the other people continue working as usual. I can't um, understand that. You know, we, we, have a, we have a policy where once we understand a person is you know showing symptoms we send home the person get it confirmed and we sanitize we close for the day sanitize before anything we, we invite person back into the system because you don't know that person who has been shown are showing the symptoms would have been like in the canteen in the restroom all over the place so you know how can you just sanitize the area and everything is normal that is my concern. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I must admit, I didn't hear the um, I didn't hear the statement, but I can't, <laughs> I can't keep up with the press releases and press conferences. However, um, everything is re re within context. No, um, if the workplace is doing what they're supposed to do, because workplaces are issued instructions, it's on the ministry's website on exactly how to conduct your business. Do the cleaning, set the staff, time sharing, infection and prevention and control practices. Um, if we're following all of these, then persons shouldn't be at risk. But guess what? If somebody's symptomatic and they're wearing their mask, they're protecting other persons. If somebody is doing hand sanitization all the time, they're protecting they other persons. Huh? They shouldn't be at work. They shouldn't even be at work and be symptomatic. They are told just being home. Right. And if somebody becomes symptomatic, then they are sent home because that's the, the bigger risk. Now, it's only is when persons fail to follow the, the standard precautions, they are standard for reasons. When people fail to 
to, to follow the standard precautions and we end up into problem. So the context, if she really did say that, the context is if persons are following the instructions given to workplaces, then persons shouldn't be at risk. Um, because guess what? We're all exposed to somebody who has somebody who is positive. If that's the case, we would always stay home, never go to the supermarket, never, um, never go work, never go to church, never, ever, ever. And the persons at home would be at risk from us. But we have to, um, we have to find a balance. Just in, mm. in, in, in our presentation, we have to find a balance. So it, it, for, for really that, it, it's really in the context of persons following the instructions. And if I may add, I know what the public health team tries to do is once they have a positive case, they interview them and they find out the persons they had contact with, what was the nature of the contact, were they adhering to the precautions, and then they do a risk assessment. And persons who are thought to be high risk are quarantined and tested, and then they work their way out from there. They usually look first at the contact of the positive. The contact of the contact of the positive is not so critical in the initial phase and may still work, especially if they are adhering to the precautions as Johan said, um, until you know the test results come back and they continue. And that was done even in the first wave and it was effective. And we saw a flattening of, of the curve then. Um, so as he said, it's just important for everybody to try and do their best with all the guidance and to take the, the, the recommendations in, in context. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, is there a final question? We are practically out of time. We have two last questions, uh, Madri, uh, Andre Earl, and then Violet. So can you go ahead, please, and make them as Good evening. Good evening, all. Thank you very much to the presenters again. I, I just have a couple quick questions. I'll be very brief. The first to you, Lisa. The flu vaccine, is it currently available in our pharmacy at Bethel? Not the pharmacy, the clinic. And if so, do you recommend that we take it at this time in COVID-19. The second question yes. is for Johan, and that relates to the matter of the surfaces. He said that you can have surfaces which essentially are contaminated from 48 hours up to four days. And so the question is, is it still necessary I used to do it, I don't do it anymore, but should I resume the practice of washing off all of my groceries when I get them home? Fruits, the bread, all of the containers, all the plastic, etc. And the final question is the risk of reinfection. What does the science say in relation to that? Is there a real risk? someone having contracted COVID, can they be reinfected? The vaccine surfaces reinfection. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Andre. All right, so I checked with one of the suppliers, the vaccine um, should be here by, by mid-October. As you know, the influenza vaccine uh, changes annually because the strains that are predicted to be circulating by a World Health Organization uh, changes. So it's an annual vaccine. So hopefully by mid-October, and yes, the clinic, Bethel Clinic, will uh, stop the vaccine uh, when it arrives. Uh, my recommendation is, I do recommend that we take the vaccine. Of course, before you take the vaccine, there is a screening process that takes place. So we have to make sure that you are not having any um, acute illnesses or any other reasons why you should not have the vaccine. Uh, one example is if you have uh, anaphylactic reactions to eggs, for example. So that screening process will take place. 
uh, the CDC recommends certain high risk groups. As I said, the uh, persons older than 65, any persons with chronic illnesses, very young children, healthcare workers, persons in nursing homes. Um, I can tell you that I used to take it annually because of my exposure working in the industry, sitting in doctor's offices, et cetera. So it is recommended for healthy individuals to take it as well. It has shown effectively to reduce the time lost from work. And the best time to take it is at the beginning of the flu season, which is October coming up. So yes, I do recommend the vaccine. I hope that answers your question. And yes, it does. Allergic reaction, sorry, Maria, yes. Um, it's, it's an allergic reaction, um, a severe allergic reaction. Anaphylactic reaction is a severe allergic reaction where you would be um, all swollen, right? Airway closing off, et cetera. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, the point regarding the washing of groceries and cleaning up our surfaces. But Dr. Rodriguez, I'll hand over to you yes. on that. Right, so it would be both of us. <laughs> So um, virus can live on fomites, that is on any type of surface, including those yeah. in the supermarket. We don't expect it to get, it, it, it doesn't survive out for long. So it's not really coming from the point of production, but from the point of distribution, there's the risk. Go ahead. No, finish, finish. No, go ahead. <laughs> we're, we're, we disagree on this point, okay? <laughs> because I want to wash everything <laughs> and he does not. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have data showing that um, viruses can survive varying times, anywhere from 24 to 48 hours, and sometimes longer. Um, although for feces, I believe it was up to four days, but they aren't necessarily proving that it was viable virus there. Right. Um, and so that's a challenge, a part of the challenge. So, so, so far, the data um, doesn't actually point towards um, Persons getting infected from exposed surfaces. So, because we don't know, we take the precaution. But um, so far, we haven't gotten anybody who has been um, positive because of an exposure to knowingly, knowingly to an exposure to um, a fomite that would have been something an, a, an object that has a virus on it. So, no, so no. washing washing everything is something that I practice. Yes, and I I guess. It can't do any harm, but it's just very time consuming. Mm -hmm. yeah. And by washing everything, you mean the bread bag, you the white, the bread bag, bag <laughs> carton, everything, <laughs> everything, the soap. Yes. And, and this is oh, another thing that you can do if you're buying bulk, there are some things you can put down for four days. We think that after four days, if there's anything that's on that, it should be dead. So if it you know you buy, you know what I mean? So yeah. you okay. could. Go ahead, Auntie. Go ahead. No, yes, I'm. I'm agreeing. I'm saying possibly, but you know, we get a bit um, what's the word? Overcautious, and I know that something like coming in, going straight to the bathroom, getting off those outdoor clothes, putting them to into the laundry, and so on. A lot of people do that, and I, I still do it. But how long do we continue to do that sort of um, ritual? I, I, I think until we pass this pandemic, if it doesn't hurt to be careful, that's me. But at the end of the day, I guess everybody has to everybody make that decision. Thinking. Personally, I appreciate information, but honestly, I can't. It, it is interfere, interfere with my quality of life to be so stringent with these practices. I'm, I'm honestly unhappy with all of this that we have to do. Um, so that's my approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, not, re not so oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Reinfection Bob. question, Dr. Rodriguez. Reinfection. Oh, yes, yes. It's all of the sounds. Okay. In terms of the reinfection, um, there have been reports, but it seems to be rare. Um, in the, the, they're finding too, as as Johans had said, that after infection, they're finding that person, some persons, their antibody levels fall off pretty rapidly and sometimes to undetectable levels. There's another study though that shows that there may be a role in 
T cells, which, are, which is another arm of the immune system, playing a role in offering some sort of protection. So the, the, the challenge with the question is that um, the data is still uncertain or it's, it's still being investigated about whether we can get lasting immunity, like how long will it last if we do get it, um, which part of the immune system is responsible, therefore what's the significance of not being able to detect antibody and is T cell going to be protecting, our T cells are going to be protective. So we're really not sure, but so far based on just observing the progression of the, of the disease so far, it seems as though it is possible just based on some reports, but not common. Thank you. Um, final question, Lisa? Any? Yes, from Violet. That's our last question for the evening. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, presenters. You have done a great job this evening. I just want to ask about the field hospital. It should be up and running by the end of the week. Should persons living in close proximity to that location be concerned? And if so, what kinds of precautions should we take? Okay. So the field hospital. Your hands. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, there's one field hospital for a region. Our field hospital is designated for, I don't know if it was announced. It's a, in case it wasn't announced, it's one of our hospitals that has a lot of land space. This hospital will, this field hospital will go to the very back of that land space. For those who aren't familiar, the U.S. military has donated four field hospitals, each with a capacity of 40 persons. And they're really meant for um, short-term army use. So they go up in one day and they can use them. We will um, equip it with modern conveniences because it lacks that. And ours will go at the back of the property, not far from general population. So there's no risk for anybody in progress proximity to that area, because to tell the truth, nobody will be in proximity to that area. Uh, so it, is, it won't be a problem. Aerosolization, if possible, is only 260 feet, and that hospital is clear past 160 feet of anybody. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, yes, good, okay. It was announced as Chess Hospital, but thank you. You know, Chess Hospital compound is a big compound. Yeah. And it has an existing isolation area that um, needs to be fixed up. So this field hospital will actually go beyond that into the land of Never Never Land. So everybody is fine. Um, mm. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. I think that was our final question. I just want to read two quick things from the, the one. Yes, from the chat section, Marie Haywood to everyone, anaphylactic reaction is the same as allergic reaction. Apart from COVID, still wash most everything. Yes, the bread bag. Some of the best supermarkets have mouse dung among the shelves. So imagine two mouse or rat pee. The cashier also handling all the items from all the monies handled. So there's some cross infection there. Um, should we still be cautious? Yes, we should. <laughs> and we should wipe everything. <laughs> right, you <Yoren? laughs> If it's not COVID, it will be something else, like leptospirosis or something. You cannot wash everything. <laughs> What's, what's that, Lisa? You can't wash everything. No, you can't wash everything, but some things you can wipe off and some things you can put aside until you feel as though sufficient time has passed. You know, and you use common sense in terms of, you know, if you can't wipe it, just the way that you get the stuff out the bag and so on. I, I acknowledge that, you know, there are going to be variations, but, you know, it's a challenging time. I too miss not having to be so vigilant. You know, but these are unprecedented times. You know, what came to my mind yesterday as I was out shopping with my niece and we bought, she bought bulla cake 
and we started to eat the bulla in the car. And here I am coming home, washing all the groceries, and I'm saying, what imagine? Yes. We didn't think of washing the bulla bag yes. before opening it. Yes. And we were eating as we came out of the supermarket. So, you know, what do you do? <laughs> it's really weird. It's a weird time, everybody. Um, we're co we have come to the end of our, our, our forum. It has been a very good interactive session. The presenters have presented us with a lot of information, excellent presentations, and good um, questions and answer se session. So let me just thank everyone for having participated in this forum. I want to uh, thank especially our presenters for their preparation and their excellent presentation to us all. And we, we pray that you will continue to do good in this um, pandemic and that you and all your, your clients will be, remain safe. Thank you to the the persons who were who set up for this um, this evening's event, specifically um, Mr. Gary Callum and his team. Thank you very much for your technical support. Deacon Lawrence Brown and your team for helping with the logistics. Deacon Lola Shakes and her team in the in the administrative department of the of the the church for your your support. Also, thanks to the Holistic Health Promotion Committee for having put this session on and spearheaded the preparation. Um, specifically, Sister Joan Mars, who, who led the team. Thank you all very much. And um, thank you for inviting me to participate in this evening's event. I really appreciate the invitation, the invitation and the privilege of interacting with you even from such a far away place, miles away, so um, in Portland. Thank you, of course, for, and thank God for his, his blessings and for the technology that we now enjoy. Sorry that mine failed for a moment or two, but um, you know what these things are like little glitches and we recovered quickly. Thank you all so much for a wonderful evening and please go safely even though we've, we've gone over a curfew time. Did you realize that? Let's hope no one is traveling too far away and will be safe as we keep safe on the roads and as we keep safe protecting everyone from COVID-19. God bless you all. Blessings, everyone. Thanks, too. So, Madri. Yes, Sister Joan. We're thanking you as well. You've thanked everybody, and we are indeed grateful that you were able to marshal the proceedings from your distant part in Portland. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, now, Joan. Uh, I know you said the vote of thanks. Um, Everyone, I see the comments and as a team, we feel heartened that the effort was well worth it. All we can say is maybe just one change, just one adjustment we should identify because we really have to live with COVID. Maybe as long as two years, four years, we really don't know. Thanks to everyone for participating. It was really an excellent evening. Oh, Joan Mars. Thank you, Joan. Hi, Joan. You're not just nice to me. I'm trying to figure who is Kenneth. <laughs> um, question is, is the YouTube version going to be available for persons to... Um, Yes, there is a there is there is a link put up by Gary. Gary has put up a link so persons can copy it. It's in the chat section. Okay. All right. Okay. Stay Thank safe, you. everyone. All the best. Thank you. Same to Good you. Evening. To God be the glory. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.
Night, night. Night, everyone. Very good. Excellent. Thank you all. You Thank too. you, team. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.